Good morning. morning. Come as you are, imperfect and misunderstood. Come as you are, talented and hopeful. Come as you are, tired and frightened. Come as you are, holy and loved. Let us worship the Lord. God is love. God has loved us from the beginning. God will love us to the end and in between. God wants us to love ourselves and one another. Even when we fail, and we will always fail, God forgives us and loves us just the same. Let us confess our sins before God and one another, first aloud and then in silence. God of abundant mercy, you embodied us in the life of Jesus. You ate with sinners and shared with outcasts. You loved with boldness and lived with grace. Forgive us when we do not trust your love. Fair. 
friends in Christ hear the good news. There is nothing we can do and nothing we can fail to do that will separate us from the love of God. In the love of Christ, we are forgiven and free to try again. Amen. As people who have been forgiven and granted peace by God, it is right that we respond in joy by sharing peace and forgiveness with one another. This is an ancient practice of the church, and it is more than a friendly greeting. It is a prayer, a blessing, and a bold affirmation of our faith that God wants, more, wants peace for God's whole creation. The peace is a powerful reminder of who we are in Christ both individually and corporately. We are a people who have been given peace and have been made whole. And we are a people called to make peace and bring about wholeness. People of God, may the peace of Christ be with you. While the passing of the peace is a tradition we youth love to bring into the worship setting at Reed Memorial on Youth Sunday, we are also aware of current health practices. <laughs> We invite you, as you share the peace of Christ with one another, instead of shaking hands or hugging, to use the peace sign, to air high-five your neighbor, or to use the word and symbolism of namaste, where it's like, put your hands together. Or, just placing your right hand over your heart while offering a nod or smile. Please be seated. Good morning. And welcome to worship at Reed Memorial Presbyterian Church on this beautiful morning. I don't know about you, but I'm very glad to see the return of the sun because it feels like years since we've seen it. Uh, I am Hannah Norris, and I am the Director of Youth Ministries here at Reed Memorial. And if you haven't figured it out yet, Today is Youth Sunday. On Youth Sunday, our youth provide leadership for most parts of the service and help to write the liturgy as well. Um, I encourage you to take a moment and fill, fill out the friendship pad in your pew. Um, this helps us know who is here, and if you are a visitor, we ask that you would please leave us a way to contact you in the days ahead. We have a few announcements this morning. Directly after worship is our annual youth auction and luncheon. This year, it will be catered by Fat Man's Cafe, and there are many, many great offerings of goods and services, including babysitting, um, vacation homes, dog sitters, meals that are delivered, or dinner parties, sports packages, and packages from local vendors like Escape Outdoors and Land of the. Um, there's also MDO packages, Reed's Roots has a package in there, and uh, Reed's Youth has one as well. Um, I would draw your attention to Dr. Matt's letter um, in the um, bulletin about current health practices and where we are at in that. And finally, we are still a few weeks out from Holy Week, but the schedule is in your bulletin. We will have one service on Easter Sunday at 9.30 a.m. I ask that you keep in your prayers this morning Anne McKnight. She had a mild heart attack and is expected to be released from MCG today. Um, we ask for no visitors. Thank you.
Please pray with us. God of grace and God of glory, God our helper and our hope, God who set the world in motion, God who created us in God's own image, we give you thanks for meeting us here. Holy God, we live in a world of bad news and bruises and heartaches. We find ourselves surrounded by bigotry and bullying and isolation and competition and abuse, all of which can make us feel lost, wondering if it is possible to wander too far from your love. But God, we know you have always met us where we are. You met Rachel in her grief. You met Joseph in a faraway land. You met Jonah in the belly of a great fish. You met Ruth and Naomi on a long journey. You met James and John on a seashore. And you met a woman at a well. You met your disciples on the sea in the midst of a storm. You met your friends, even the ones who would betray you, around a table. And you met a criminal on a cross. And as if that were not enough, you met violence on a cross, you met fear and thorns and spears and bitter wine, you met abandonment in those who left your body, you met death itself in a closed off tomb. But because of who you are, you did what you always do. You looked at what was and breathed new life into it. You met death and you introduced it to your own love. Love that does not let go. Love that does not leave us alone. Love that works and pushes and strengthens and above all endures and does not fail. Love that brings forth resurrection. So on this day, O God, resurrect us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that you might transform us, your simple, ordinary people. That is what you have always done, so we trust that you will do it again. In your Son's name, we pray together the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As a part of our call to discipleship is a call to generosity, a call to share our gifts for God's work in the world and receive the joy that comes from giving. Let us joyfully offer our gifts to God.
God of here and now, the more we look for you, the more we find you. This morning, you were in the sun, bringing the promise of a new day. Last night, you were in the moon, reminding us of how big your cosmos are. We see you in children, unashamed to express need or love. We see you in the leaves that fall, reminding us to let go. We hear you in the word. We find you in our church. God of here and now, the more we look for you, the more we find you. So in gratitude of the love that guides us, holds us, and pulls us, we give you this gift. May it be used in ways to find you more and build your kingdom here. Amen. please join us for the children's moment. And if on your way down, you could collect the dimes for dinner's buckets. Good morning, boys and girls. I am Ruthie, and this is Amelia. We have a question for you. What is this? Does anyone know what this is? A penny? What is it worth? One cent? Okay. What is this? Yeah, a penny? 
what is this worth? One cent. One cent. Good job. So they're both one cent. <laughs> we want to tell you a story about a time when a shiny penny was worth more. In the book Love Does, which we are reading as a congregation, the author, Bob Goff, tells us about his childhood interactions with the storekeeper. As a kid, Bob would go to the store and he would choose some candy. He would then take all the change he had collected and spread it on the counter. He let the man behind the counter count out what was owed. Learning to count money was hard for Bob, so he would have the storekeeper count it for him. And one morning, he could tell by the look on the man's face that there wasn't enough money. We're one penny short, the storekeeper said. He said we to let Bob know it wasn't just Bob's problem, but that the store owner would help too. After a long pause, the storekeeper took one of Bob's pennies, rubbed it with some vinegar, and revealed a coin that looked brand new, like this one. Then he returned it back to the pile of pennies. The man then said, in my store, shiny pennies are worth double. Even as a little kid, Bob knew that shiny pennies weren't actually worth more. But that day, Bob believed it because of the kind words of the storekeeper. Bob learned two important lessons that day. One, that kind words have the power to change everything. And two, that sometimes Jesus does math a little differently to help people that need it. We get to remember that all people are worth so much to God. Therefore, we get to help others by sharing what we have and offering kind words. This is why we collect the pennies and other coins one Sunday a month to help out our neighbors that need help getting food. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to be better at loving each other and putting love into action. Amen. You can return to your seats with mom and dad, or you can worship in Children's Church. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 9, found on page 193 in your pew Bible. Listen now for the word of the Lord. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be God's people, God's treasured possessions. It is not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set the Lord's heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of people. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that God swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love and keep God's commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Prepare our hearts, O God, to hear your word for us this morning. May it speak into the parched places that long for new life. May it speak of hope and grace and love. May it speak to each of us. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14 and verse 17. It can be found on page 1253 in your pew Bible. As we do during Sunday evening youth, we will be reading two different versions of this passage. First, the New Revised Standard Version, followed by the message. This is a way that we have found increases our understanding of the word. Listen now for the word of the Lord. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Listen also for the word of the Lord from the message. So chosen by God for this new life of love, dressed in the wardrobe of God, picked out for you compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive and offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Let very detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of Jesus, thanking God, the Father, every step of the way. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I'm going to be completely honest. When I first read this verse, I thought it was the most stereotypical Bible verse I had ever read. I mean, it has all the right key words. Kindness, humility, forgiveness, love, be thankful. There isn't much that hasn't been said before about those words. So while all of them are very important to us as Christians, I think we really only need to focus on two words in particular. Put on. Paul tells us to put on these qualities, implying that we can also take them off when we want to. To put on something requires intention. Putting on a quality or attribute requires intention, just like putting on a pair of shoes would. Whether we plan for them to or not, the clothes we wear reflect who we are the person we want to be, the sense of self we offer to others. This isn't to say that outwardly appearance is the most important thing, but it does matter. I mean, if you're at the hospital and some guy in a graphic t-shirt and cut-off shorts walks up to you and says, hi, I'm your surgeon, <laughs> you're going to be a little skeptical. In the same way, declaring our faith verbally just isn't enough. We must also live our faith through our actions. Christians don't have a uniform with a big C written on the front that identifies us as followers of Christ. So rather, it's our actions that proclaim to the world who we are and what we're about. I've always been a performer. In middle school, I did ballet, and in high school, I've been involved with the theater department at my school. So when I hear the words, words put on, I automatically associate it with putting on a show. And that sounds a little fake and a little ingenuine, as if we pretend to be a Christian for the show of it or because it's expected. But then we get home and then at the end of the day, we just take it all off. Putting on, a, on an empty show isn't fulfilling, going through the actions of a Christian but lacking the substance behind it. I don't think that's what Paul means here, though. I think faith is very much a personal, 
individual relationship with God. But at the same time, it's extremely difficult to be deep-rooted in faith without a community of support. As Christians, it is our job to spread the word of the Lord, be ambassadors for the Lord, in a sense. As a senior in high school, I've been on a lot of college tours recently. And at each new admissions office, there are always ambassadors of the school with their name tags and their smile and their ready handshake. And that is how I know that that's the person I need to go up to um, to find information on that school. In the same way, we must present ourselves as Christians, though we don't have a literal uniform, in order for others to know that we are available to be approached if they are in need of support, of fellowship, of discussion, of prayer, or of love. So if we think about it this way, putting on the qualities Paul is telling us to have here isn't as an empty show, it's not ingenuine, but instead as a way for others to recognize us. Even if we wake up every day and decide to put on these characteristics that a Christian should have, we still all falter. But by making it known that this is who you are and this is the type of person you want to be, it's easier to recover from inevitable mistakes when you're not so kind or compassionate or patient. Showing others what you aspire to be makes you hold yourself to a higher standard. So Paul's, Paul tells us to put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, but the list of qualities that a Christian should have could go on indefinitely. But everything he does mention is just a different manifestation of love. Compassion is loving others when they do not deserve it. Kindness is love in action. Humility is loving others before yourself. Gentleness is treating others with love. And patience is enduring and long-suffering for love. Since our Lenten Bible study is revolving around his novel, Love Does, I'd like to end with a quote from Bob Goff. Love is never stationary. In the end, love doesn't just keep thinking about it or planning for it. Simply put, love does. Lucy discussed this great, great wardrobe that Paul talks about putting on. We need to think about what it looks like when we put this wardrobe on and also what we have to take off to get it on. Putting on this wardrobe of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience allows us to think and act more like Jesus. Verse 13 says to bear with each other. Bearing with each other could mean to some to keep another one's burdens and them accountable. This, seems, this is seen quite often in everyday life. People pointing out the mistakes of others and not letting them go as to keep this person accountable. There are times when holding people accountable for their actions is both necessary and justifiable. While it is necessary in order for people to improve on whatever it may be to hear their mistakes and learn from them in order to improve, it is also critical that people are forgiven for their mistakes. We have to be able to, to call people out in order to correct them, but we are not supposed to hold it against them. We are supposed to forgive them. It is meant for us to hold on to people with love as Jesus would want us to do. Humans have a tendency to hold, to hold you to others' mistakes until the bitter end. This, however, is not what we're supposed to do. Rather than holding on to one another's mistakes, we should hold people close that we love in the way that is a reflection of Christ. We're supposed to bear with each other in love. Loving is sacrificing and showing commitment. Showing commitment can be like what I said earlier. When you call someone out for their mistakes, you do it because you love them and you want them to improve their habits. You're showing commitment for their improvement. I heard about this idea a great amount during my time on the Augusta Prep football team. The coaches would always point out our mistakes to us, but only so that we could learn from them and make improvements by not making the same mistakes again. The coaches would yell at us plenty, but they did not cling to our mistakes. They only used them as teaching tools to show us what not to do and show us how to correct it. This is what we need to be like. Do not cling to others' mistakes, but help them to show them what they did wrong and how they can do better next time. Love is also showing sacrifice. Bob Goff, in his book, Love Does, that our congregation is reading, says, quote, but the kind of love that God created and demonstrated is a costly one because it involves sacrifice and presence. 
It's a love that operates more like a sign language than being spoken outright, end quote. By sacrifice, I do not mean moving plans around to go spend the afternoon with someone, but rather by looking how can I positively impact those around me? How can I serve others? How can I be helpful to others? Jesus did not hold people accountable, but he held them close. He loved them and taught them how to serve and make an impact on others. This is how we need to be. We do not need to hold people accountable. We need to hold them close, and when we hold them close, we need to love them. We need to show them commitment and sacrifice. We may not always know the right thing to say to those that are struggling, but often just having a presence makes a big difference. Having a presence shows commitment. Having a presence shows sacrifice. Having a presence shows that you love this person. Having a presence sometimes may not be huge, but it can make all the difference in the world. We need to have a presence. We need to forgive others around us and bear them close and use their mistakes as a teaching device so that the same mistake is not made again. Forgive. Forgive one another if any one of you has a grievance against someone. Bear others close to you and do not love. Bear others close to you with love and not with a grudge. Forgive. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Please stand in body or in spirit as we affirm our faith together using words from 1 John 4 as adapted from the Montreat Youth Conferences. Where does love come from? But what does God's love mean for us? Why should we take the risk to love when it's easier to hide behind fear? We love because God first loved us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. God is love, and lives with the fire of God, and God is the fire of
My friends, there is no doubt that Christ has surrounded us today as a part of this service. We give great thanks to God for our young people, for all the 20 plus who have been a part of this service, for Hannah Norris, our Director of Youth Ministries, and her work with them throughout the year, but particularly in preparation for this day. I think they might deserve a round of applause that we give thanks to God for them. And as we depart from this place and go forth and head to lunch, I hope, let us hear this word. Children of God, let love guide you as you put on the wardrobe of God. Let love guide you towards compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. Let love guide you as you practice being second. Let love guide you to forgiveness. Let love guide you to yourself and to one another. You are claimed. You are loved. Guide yourself by that and go in peace.